Church family, Psalm 145.4 reminds us that we are called to pass on God's works to the next generation. To do that, we must maintain our campus as a welcoming, safe place for all who visit. Several areas are in need of repair and we're launching a fundraising campaign to address these needs. This is more than just upkeep, it's an investment in the future of our church and the generations to come. Please prayerfully consider how you can be a part of this effort. No gift is too small and your support will make a lasting impact. You can find specially marked envelopes in the foyer or give online through our website. Last year, through your generous donations, our church was able to provide Christmas gifts to over 75 children in foster care. Would you consider donating a Walmart or Targa gift card this year from off of the tree that's located in the foyer? Once you have purchased your gift card, please write the dollar amount on the gift card and place in one of the boxes in the foyer. Please return them no later than Sunday, November 24th. Go to the Next Steps table or the events page of our website for more information or to register for any of these and other events. Good morning, guys. I am not Pastor Chad. Pastor Josh, just in case you don't know, famous pastor. Um, privilege of being at this church now for almost two years. It's been amazing. Um, I love it. So, like we are talking about, since the beginning of time, someone has been chasing, right, to be with us. Now we're talking about the pursuit of God, right? God takes the damaged, the destroyed, the lost, the forgotten, and says, this is my creation. This is who I created. This is who I love. I want to make them beautiful again. I want them to bring them to me again. I want to heal their brokenness. I want to give them that hope, that purpose that they seek when they don't seek me. I want to supply that for them. It's awesome. That's God's chase for us is his love for us. And the Bible, right, is God's love letter to us to show us over and over and over again how much God pursues us. How much God pursues us. There's a passage, you probably know it, right? It's John 3, 16, okay? Um, the first Peter thing, sorry, we're, we're not going to be there. Circumstances just didn't happen, it's not happening. But we will be in the passage. Um, we're going to be in Luke, Luke chapter 18. You guys can go there, we're going to go through there quickly. But I'm going to share this verse with you. There was a preacher, right? His name was Henry Morehouse. And 99% of the time when he preached, he preached one passage. We probably know what it is. John 3, 16. Right? I'm going to put somebody on a spot right now. They know John 3, 16. They could just say it. Somebody with a loud voice. I'm going to call people out if you don't know. John 3, 16. All right, you're all going to be shy? Okay, that's fine. That's right. And hopefully your family doesn't know that because you see that sign at football games. Hopefully you're in the Bible. But you do see that all over the place. John 3.16. And so this man, that's what he preached over and over and over again. Why? Because it's the gospel. Because it's good news. Because it is the story that changed everything. Right? For God so loved the world, right, that he sent his son. Right? Why did he send his son? To pursue us. To love us. To make us whole again, to restore us, to redeem us. Why did Christ suffer on the cross? To restore us, to redeem us, to make us whole again. It doesn't matter what we were chasing at the time. All right? God wanted to be with his creation again because we broke it. Right? And the crazy thing about this man was he was on his deathbed. He's feeling ill. And he looked up and he told his friends, he said, if the Lord will rise me again, I should like to preach from the text, God so loved the world. He understood the importance of God's message of that he loves us. And if you've been in the church, you've heard that since you're a five-year-old boy chasing girls, running at the side of the table and bleeding all over the place, right? You've heard that forever if you're from the church, but it doesn't make it as strong as we really understand it. 
It is more powerful than we'll ever imagine, even if we've heard it every day of our life for the next 80 years. It is the most powerful message we'll ever know that God saw how broken we were and how much we screwed everything up without a doubt. Why? Because we wanted to chase this or chase that or chase this and forgot about our creator. And God said, I love you still. Not the love that we see the world that we're trying to chase over and over again, but the love that is God's unconditional forever love. And it is saying, I love you. You're broken, but I'm here for you. All you have to do is believe in the son that I sent, my son, for you have eternal life with me forever. So that's why that passion is important. That's why you can preach it over and over and over again. And that's why the preacher said, if I were to rise again out of my deathbed, I'd want to share one more thing. God so loved the world. Which is crazy to think about because it's that same broken world that we chase all the bad things in and we surround ourselves with people we shouldn't surround ourselves in and we forget how much God loves us. That's when he comes and said, I love you. So, there are some important things we need to talk about. We need, to, we need to decide what we chase in life and how important that is. Okay, so what I decide, what we decide to chase in life shows our passions. Without a doubt, if you're chasing something, and maybe if it's in the corporate world and you're pushing somebody aside because you want that promotion, right? Maybe it's a chasing thing where you are trying to chase and make your family more happy, more provided for. And while that can be a good, healthy thing, that's an unhealthy way to do it, it shows our passions, right? We chase, shows our passions, right? But it also shows, like, shows our life and what's important. It shows our life and what's important. So we're going to kind of look at that because I want you guys to understand real quick, um, we're chasing things, we can sometimes get confused of what the priority really is. We're sinful. I do it too. It's not a judgment thing. So when we choose to chase anything that is not God, we literally separate ourselves from the creator and his plan for our life. So we chase anything that is not of God, we separate ourselves from his plan for our lives. Is God still pursuing us? Absolutely. Absolutely but we are pulling ourselves away from him to pursue something that's not of God. And in the end, we chase things like that. We do that pursuit. The result is the same. We're burned out. We're lonely. We're frustrated. We're hopeless. When I pursue anything, when I chase anything that is not of God, right, I'm going to burn out. I'm going to feel lonely. I'm going to feel sinful. I'm going to feel frustrated. I'm going to feel hopeless every time. Because I'm not giving the creator of the universe the priority of the role he has in his life. I'm stepping away from that and saying, I got this now. I got this now. But when we chase, we follow Jesus, and we understand the gospel, we really understand, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, not only for the whole world, but for us. We understand that. We understand that he is worthy of, of us to stop chasing that and yet pursue him. We understand that that's when our lives change. Guys, that's when our family's lives change. That's when the church and the church changes. When we decide, I want to chase God. I want to realize that my every passion is what I should be focusing on when it comes to God. So, in Galatians 5, and if you don't want to go there, that's fine, because the important words are up on our stained glass, right? Galatians 5, 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So how can God change this sinful man standing in front of you 
that often chases things that are not things I should be chasing. And my whole life, if you look at it, right, <laughs> you can see all the sins, all the mistakes I made, right, all the decisions I made that were not of God. And to be honest with you guys, I'll make other decisions coming up that I'm going to chase things that I should not chase. I'll be following the worldly passions in my life, right? So God kind of gives us the answer. He said, how does that work? How can I change this brokenness, your brokenness, into a masterpiece that God created? Because we have to remember God is the creator, but not as God the creator, he's the perfect creator. He's the holy creator. So when God said he created us and he's going to restore us, he's going to restore us to his masterpiece. And the fruits of the Spirit is how we change our passions to be of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When I read those, when you see those on the stained glass, right? Let's be honest. Which one of those is a constant struggle for you? Now everyone stand up and share with the whole class. <laughs> right? You see those and you're like, yes. When I think of God's goodness, we think of those because that's what he shows us. But then when I think of what I'm supposed to be created and the masterpiece he's trying to do, I look up and say, but I'm so bad at all those. But the Bible says I was created by you. And I look and I see those, right? And it can be overwhelming. Honestly, if I'm going to be honest, and hopefully you guys are too, if I were to chase those things in my life as much as I chased other things in my life, then they wouldn't be so scary to try to follow. But in all reality, right, me chasing to be patient and self-controlled, that's not something that I do enough. Because I need to be more patient. And God has given me ways to be more patient. I need to have more self-control. Yet, what do I do? What do I do? What do we do? We chase everything else we can in our life besides that what the bible says it's right there the fruit of the spirit that means the holy spirit has equipped us to do these things so as i said we're going to be in luke 18 um, we're going to start in verse 18 we're going to walk through this passage Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Give you guys a chance to be there if you're not there already. So to sum up real quickly, right, this is the story of the rich young ruler, right? This rich man didn't think it was worth it, right? So that's the first conversation we have is the rich man doesn't think it's worth it to follow Jesus, right? Jesus says you have to realize it's worth it. You have to realize it's worth it. Peter chimes in and says that, like, the disciples think it's worth it. And then Jesus reassures them it's worth it. So what are we talking about? Let's read. Starting verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit life, eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And the rich young ruler said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So here it is a well, rich, important, impactful Jewish man wants to have what Jesus is offering. Now, keep in mind the titles that he's titled by in your Bible is rich, young, important, Jewish. Right? 
but he also wants what Jesus is offering. So he asks what he must do, and he says, I've done all these things, right? Because he thinks there's nothing out of his grasp. If he wants something, if he chases it long enough, he's going to get it. I want eternal life. I want to know I'm going to live forever, right? You thought these, this concept all started with superhero movies. No, it's not a thing. Like, he wanted it, so he chased it. So he asked Jesus, because he knows, he addresses him as a teacher, that this is not a normal man, right? He's addressing him as a teacher as a respect, someone who knows of things he doesn't know. So if we keep reading, we understand. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. <clears throat> the reason why Jesus, and often Jesus does this with us too, is goes right after the one thing we hold on to the most tightly. So if we are effective in chasing something and we have achieved what we wanted to do, we hold on tightly, that is the first thing God confronts. Because he wants us to let go of things that aren't of him so we can follow him. Same thing happens here. Rich, young ruler. So he says, okay, sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Jesus wants to show his heart condition. Jesus wants to show our heart condition. But Jesus wants to show him this because he wants him to see he has a need for a savior. Even though life can be good sometimes, we think we got it all put together, we all need a savior. We all need Jesus. He wanted to show him that he didn't need worldly riches, popularity, status. Jesus was pausing right here to point him to salvation that was through him and through him alone. Verse 23. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. See, Jesus, being the Son of God, knows his heart condition. He knows when he's asking this, his main pause, his main stop was his wealth. His wealth was controlling him so much, making him so greedy that it was now a rival, right, against God's work in his life. It was a rival against the gospel. It was a rival against kingdom things. Realizing his selfish ways, knowing this was too far and he was too uncomfortable to make this step, he became very sad. It's a weird statement, but all of a sudden he's just sad. And there's a couple reasons why this is probably happening. He's probably sad because he's always been able to get what he wants. Rich, young, right? Popular. Even, even the sense of being Jewish, he becomes very sad. Because I can't give up everything I've worked hard for. Everything I've wanted. I have except for this one thing and I can't get it. I can't buy my way into it. I can't earn my salvation. It's very clear because none of us can earn our salvation which to him he might feel very sad, but for to me, and probably us, I'm grateful that I can't earn my salvation because I would just earn it for like five seconds, and then I would lose it. And I would earn it, and I would lose it. I would learn it, and I would lose it. But our salvation is based on the power of Christ and the blood of Christ that is eternal. Right? And no one can rip me out of God's hands because he's my creator. He's who created me. He's my salvation. His whole plan is in place so I can be redeemed through his work, through his plan. Because as we know, if you've lived more than 
I don't know, a couple years of your life, you realize our plans are always thwarted. Our plans always fail. No matter how hard we chase something, we have the unconditional love of God who sent his son to die on the cross so we simply can believe in who Jesus is and what he is and have our salvation set and be reassured in that forever. And the Bible talks about this. We're going to end with that, but I want to go through this, make sure we see all this passage. So Jesus shares with the others. I want to think about the disciples that are sitting around hearing this, knowing if it's difficult for this rich, wealthy man to get to heaven, and we don't got any money, right? How are we get to heaven? But you get the feeling, you get the understanding that Jesus isn't talking about money. He is talking about the hearts and the passions of the disciples. He's sharing this because he wants his disciples to hear, God cares about our heart. And out of our heart flows our passions and what we love. So what Jesus is asking us can be difficult. Because we live in a world surrounded by pressure to keep up, to lo- live up to, to have it all, to look the part. These expectations we chase can mess with our heart, our soul. So we struggle. Rich, poor, old, young. We all struggle with the concept of chasing. To trying to be something that we weren't meant to be. Let's keep going in chapter 18. Those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or his wife or his brothers or his parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. The disciples show immediate concern, right? This guy came to him and seemed like he had it all put together and he can't be saved. Jesus is quick to remind them they are looking at it wrong. It's impossible with man, but it's possible with God because salvation is from God. Salvation is from Christ and Christ alone. Not man, not rules, not worldly things. You can see God can take a chaser, greedy, prideful, materialistic, selfish, in high school, I was just called an overall punk. Hopefully, I've grown after that. And look at the heart condition, right? And remove things that aren't from God and replace them for a passion for Christ. Ultimately, this is what happens when God is sanctifying our lives through Christ. Is he wants to take out the things that we follow that aren't of God and turn them into following the things that are of God. So he wants to take out our lustful heart, right? And he wants us to actually just pursue love. He wants to take out our greediness, right? And have us pursue self-control. And you get the idea. Guys, this is ultimately what happens. We see over and over and again in the Bible. When we truly give our life to Christ. When we give our life to Christ and we say, we, we believe the power is through Christ. The power is through the gospel. The power is through the message of Christ and what Christ did on the cross. We truly believe that. That's when the life change happens. Even if you're struggling with a passion that is not of God, and you have your whole life, God says, I'm going to restore and redeem your heart to follow me. I'm going to give you people 
that can help you and pick you up, but ultimately I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit that is going to point you to the fruits of the Spirit that you can pursue. That you can pursue. Guys, the same God who sent his son to die on the cross for us and use that power to raise Christ from the dead is the same power that reigns in every Christian who believes in him. But we act like it's too tough. Guys, dropping your worldly chases that you have that become unhealthy and toxic and hard not harder than Jesus defeating all sin for all mankind and raising from the dead and reigning. And that's the power we have through the Holy Spirit. So don't feel defeated because I think sometimes, again, we see these up here and we see our life. We know the truth. We go, this is too hard. And you're right, it is too hard to do it without Christ. Guys, that's why God wrote us a love letter that points to his truth and helps us understand, even when we can't understand, how much he loves us. And if you were the only person that ever existed in all of mankind and all of life, right, God would have still sent his son to die for you because he's our personal savior. He personally cares about everyone who is sitting right now thinking about their struggles. He personally loves you. He personally cares for you. And we say the word love, and we don't even really understand the word love because we're using the definition we have, but our version of love is surrounded by a world. God's love is perfect. God's love is holy. God's love is unconditional. God's love is forgiving. God's love is forgiving and doesn't hold a grudge. We've all been there. We've all been forgiven, and yet the person still holds a grudge. That's not God's love. That's not how God created love. So if we need some life stories to, to just make sure that we believe how much God is about pursuing us, In a minute, I'm going to have Pastor Daniel come up here, and he's going to share real quick. So he might need a microphone. Or maybe, whatever, which one. Okay. Um, guys, let's talk about David. Just, just real briefly, right? David is the ultimate chaser of fame, glory, women, right? But what happens? His life just changed. His eternity has changed. In so much way that he started using that same passion he had to chase God. And once that happened, he became, what does the Bible say about David? A man after God's own heart. David is not perfect. I'm going to share something real quick and then I'm going to have Pastor Dan to come up and share. Guys, ultimately, this is part of my testimony is I am grateful, talking about last night, I am grateful to be at a spot I never thought I would be, and then I never thought I'd be again. And that's the opportunity to be a minister of the gospel. I love it. I felt that calling when I was that 17 to 19 year old punk that we talked about earlier. I felt that calling, I felt that pull. I knew that God had a plan for my life. And that plan couldn't have to be based on grades because my grades were horrible in high school. I didn't care enough. I knew that plan couldn't be a, a career plan because I had no career plan. So I had to put all my faith in him. And I'm grateful for that, making that step in that day I did. But I'm also grateful that... And again, I'm not perfect because don't hear me as saying I'm perfect. I'm grateful that when it seemed like I had nothing, I was intentionally praying on the way to work every shift I worked when I worked this job at Dutch Bros to point out what I was grateful for, what had God done in my life. 
I wouldn't even consider myself a prayer warrior, but in those two years, I realized that's what I needed. That's what I needed. So I literally, every time I got my car instead of driving, I got to a part of the road. When I got here, no matter what was happening, I prayed, God, why am I grateful for you? What have you done in my life? Because I knew my tendency at that time is I would just be, I'd just be pity. I'd just find everything wrong in my life. I would complain of what I have to do. There would be many things I complain about, but instead I want to take the opportunity to say, God, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I have a job that I'm be around people. I'm grateful that I have a place to sleep. I'm grateful I have a family who I love very much. I was grateful for all that, and I had to keep telling myself that, and that was okay. But in that gratitude, three things happened. I learned to trust God more. Just with everyday life, I just kind of learned to trust God more. He helped me understand like the big things that are stressors, but also where to trust God. The next thing is I learned that he started cleaning house. He started working in my heart. He started working on my heart condition. And then he started giving me opportunities to serve others, to share my story, to share my testimony. So, Pastor Daniel can come up, share real quick. Uh, thanks, Pastor Josh. Yeah. Uh, so might be looking at us but like, okay, you, you guys have been Christians, you, and you, you were born in places in which people know Jesus, right? And yes, from, from my mother's womb, God had a plan for me. And he knitted me in there, and he guided me in such a way that if I can think of the first profession, let's put it that way, that I imagined that, that God had for me was to be a pastor. And I remember to this day, like one of those uh, big French pens, I, I drew myself wearing a suit. Back in the day, people wore suits, right? By wearing a suit, carrying a Bible, saying, Daniel, pastor. And I remember having that. But I chased after other things. I chased after having fun and not doing my homework. And I found a savior for that. My lies. And I relied on my lies to not do my homework and get all the playing time I wanted. And I was eight years old and my mom told me that liars don't go to heaven. God was chasing me, friends. And he took that little boy and said, that's enough. And that day I gave my life to Christ. I was a little boy and I gave my life to Christ. However, I did grow up and I found other ways to sin. And as I saw myself growing in love for my lies again as my Savior, God picked me out of that. He chased me again and brought me back to the path. And I repented of my sin and I owned my sin and I gave them to Christ. He took my sin and he forgave me. But you might be asking yourself, well, oh, that's still not that bad, right? And I, I agree with you. It could have been a lot worse. And like I said, before being a pastor, I was a bass player in our church back home in Brazil. And the weirdest thing that happened to me as a bass player was somebody interrupting me, waving at me from the back, saying, Daniel, come here, come here. There's a demon-possessed person down on the ground shaking. And then I went there and it was a girl. Um, who, who was a witch, and she had uh, her witch clothes on, and she, she was shaking and aching in pain and agony, and, and it, it was definitely not a uh, convulsion, a med medical thing. It was, it was something else. And I remember just kneeling down with my hands over her and praying to God to free that girl. And she eventually <sighs> breathed, calmed down, started crying and weeping and sat down and she was freed at that moment from that oppression. So you're saying, okay, I, it, so it wasn't that bad, right? But here's the thing, the potential to be that bad is within us all. And I remember as a young man, I hadn't met my wife yet. Well, actually I had met her, but I wasn't dating her yet. And I remember I had this dream and it was so vivid. I made every single possible bad decision I could. I remember that in the dream I was shouting at my parents. I was uh, treating every one of my friends with, in the worst possible way. And I remember that by the end of the dream I had um, got involved with all sorts of different substances. And I had just got news that one of the many girls that I had been together with in that dream, she was expecting a baby. 
And I was going to be a father of a girl that I didn't even like. And in the dream, I was in such agony that I woke up. But it was so real that when I woke up, I, I sat down by my bed and I said to myself, what have I done with my life? And then all of a sudden, I realized, wait a second, it was just a dream. And then I said, God, thank you. It was just a dream. It was just a dream. But as I laid my head down back on my pillow, I thought, but it could have been true. God freed me from that. Years later, I was a leader at the university age ministry we have at our church back home in Brazil. And we were having uh, our worship service on Saturday. And this couple walks in through the side aisle here. There's something familiar about them. So the lady looks at me and says, you remember me? And I'm like, you look so familiar. And she says, I am so and so. And I remember the name. It was the girl that was wearing witch clothes and was rolling down in the back of the church, demon-possessed. And she was wearing normal clothes, and her hair was washed and beautiful. And she said, this is my fiancé. We're going to this Baptist church close to here. And I wanted you to know, Jesus Christ saved me. Friends, if you're thinking, no, it's impossible, you don't know my story. Yeah, you guys, you're pastors and stuff. It's easy for Jesus to save you. Make no mistake. <laughs> That's another pastor right there. <laughs> Make no mistake. He's got the power to save you. Give him your life, and he will wash you with your, his powerful blood. You will be forgiven. You'll be part of the family. He will give you eternal life. In the name of Jesus, Pastor Josh. Guys, to close out, I want you guys to hear something very clearly. So I guess this could be the big idea. It's not a screen, so sorry. Here's the big idea. Even though the world says we should chase this or that, we need to understand that God is pursuing us from day one. One of my favorite passages, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when you go back to that John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, for God so loved me, that even though I was a sinner, right? And in that sin, Christ died for us. So while you're chasing this or that, I want you to remember, God is pursuing you through Jesus. As we get ready um, for blood supper that's going to come, um, I'm going to share one more passage and then pray. Psalms 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation, Jesus. Let us come to the presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him, Jesus, with a song of praise. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. And I thank you for, God, I thank you for this morning, God. God, I thank you for working at every little detail for us to be here this morning to worship you. God, I pray, um, Ultimately, as we think of our struggles and how much we fall short, God, we think about things we want. God, I pray that we remember that God, 
You died for us. You sent your son to die for us. God, I pray this morning that if people are struggling with something that they're chasing that is not of you, and they need accountability, they need prayer, they need help, God, that they would reach out. Kind of pray ultimately that if somebody doesn't feel or doesn't even understand how much you love them, that they would also reach out. God, I thank you for your love you have for us. We love you, Lord. Amen.